Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 12th episode of the Henry Schein webinar series on COVID-19. I'm Dr. Gary Severance, and normally during this Friday program for the last three months, we turn it over to Dr. David Resnick for his clinical update, and we will shortly, but I wanted to give him a well-deserved shout-out. The Atlanta Business Chronicle just gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award for his accomplishments in healthcare. It recognizes his 36 years in healthcare. In it, he says his best part of his job is the patients. In 1991, he was instrumental in opening the Oral Health Center, which was the first open healthcare clinic in the United States for people living with AIDS. In 1997, he created the HIV Dental Alliance, which shared information, policy, and research for dentistry and medicine all over the world. In 2002 to 2007, he was a member of the Presidential Council on HIV and AIDS. And outside of practicing dentistry, his passion is not only doing these weekly updates, but Diana Ross. Congratulations, Dr. Resnick. It's a pleasure to work with you, and welcome. Uh, thank you, Gary, for bringing up that award and a little bit of my past and, and my passion for uh, Miss Ross. Um, I've been a fan of hers ever since I was a young man, and she's still going at 76, and I hope to be going like many of you at 76 and being able to perform and do what we love, which is dentistry. So welcome back to a little clinical update on what we have going on around COVID-19 and dentistry. I know this is a challenging time for many of us as we're restarting our practices or planning to restart our practices and how we deal with our new circumstance. But I also want to give you a little bit of an update on where we are with some of the medical aspects of what's going on. And the first thing we'll talk about is the latest, which I think many of you have probably heard about. There was excitement over a vaccine. Um, there was Moderna's mRNA 1273. There are at least 90 candidates for vaccines. So I think what I want people to realize is um, – in my life, and, and I've worked in one pandemic in HIV for all of these years, and I've seen pharmaceutical companies and the government and, and NIH and, and WHO and people from around the world really focusing on how to address that disease. And I thought it was the miracle of modern medicine that when we went from something in the 80s that was a death sentence to something now that's a chronic disease. And now what I'm seeing is the entire world focusing on COVID-19, on medical management, on things we can do to uh, create vaccines, different treatment options, um, people looking at old medicines, new medicines, new technologies. And I think it's pretty fascinating, and I think it's going to benefit the public. And whereas I don't know if this will go away or will be living with us forever, just seeing that science and the physicians and researchers and healthcare providers all coming together in an attempt to address this, this disease is pretty remarkable. But we have a new reality, and that's what we need to talk about, and we'll get to that in a minute. What I do want to talk about is that people get excited when some of the news is out there, and the mRNA vaccines are a different kind of vaccine, where you're really not giving the virus or a portion of it. You're just triggering uh, blood levels to fight the virus. You're trying to create antibodies. So it doesn't prove the vaccine will pr produce immunity. It's just a promising suggestion of where this company is going. They had three different doses in the trial. They had 25, 100, and 250. 45 participants. And did you see how excited the world got about this, which I think is sort of interesting in the stock market as well? Eight people received doses of 25 and 100 micrograms in March, responded the best. So it was a smaller dose. They developed antibodies that were just as high or higher than antibodies found in people who had gotten coronavirus and then recovered, which is good. But remember, we don't know what these antibodies mean with the exception of you've had the disease. We don't know if it's going to provide immunity. We don't know if it does provide immunity, how strong immunity, or for how long the immunity will last. But this is something that is a new technique. It's a vaccine that, if it did work, would be able to come to market a lot sooner. And then you saw the stock market just go ba-boom. It jumped right up, and then it went down. And you'll see a bunch of that. People are getting excited about any progress. And I think that makes sense. 
Think about us from the dental perspective where our businesses have really been harmed by this uh, uh, epidemic and where we're really not able to do what we do best, which is treat patients, eliminate oral disease, and make sure that our patients remain healthy. We're, we've been basically shut down and we're just getting restarted. So all of the excitement is, I think, exciting for us too. We want to know what the latest developments are and when our practices will be you know, more normal or will this be our new reality. So part of that effort is the CDC is looking at tracking antibodies, and I think this is sort of important. Uh, not everybody in the United States needs to be tested for COVID-19. And even if I was, and I have been tested, um, I had the nasal pharyngeal test um, a couple weeks ago and it came back negative. It doesn't mean that if I went to the grocery store and I didn't have on my mask and I didn't do uh, physical distancing, that I could get infected that night after I was negative. So negative tests don't mean all that much. Our point of care testing at this point is not good. I think you might have heard that from some of the point of care or media testing that's out there. We saw from the White House that basically there's a lot of false negatives in there, that there are positive people. And so the point of care testing isn't there yet. I hope it will be there soon, and I think we'll play a very important role when it is there, but it's not there yet. So right now, what the CDC is doing is looking at 25 metropolitan areas testing blood from donors. So you have people from all different classes and portions of society that donate blood to examine the spread of, of COVID-19 throughout the country. The study is slated to begin next month in June and July, and will test tens of thousands of blood samples across the country. It really wants to aim to locate the antibodies created by the response and to see where the virus has been. So that gives us a better idea. And I think we're, as a country, beginning to, to really sort of track where we're at and where we need to go. But dentistry is different in different parts of the country, depending on where you are and what your state is allowing. But remember, the CDC guidelines are still in place, which are interim guidelines. And, and I think we don't want to forget that. So some steps to take while reopening practices. Some of this you've heard before, but I think repeating things also will ingrain it. I think we really need to, to look at how we've done business for all of our careers, if we're older providers, or at the beginning of our careers, if we're younger providers, and, and figure out how we're going to, to change into a new reality. So... Our new reality now is we need to screen our patients. So you might want to screen outside the office. We're going to set up a screening immediately outside the entrance. We'll have a podium there. We'll take temperatures. We'll have hand sanitizers and tissues. And, and the whole goal is to be welcoming and, and not look really scary, but just be welcoming and say, you know, we have this. This is the issues around it, and we want to make sure that you're safe during your visit. Whole office social distancing. That has proven to be a real challenge for me. I have to go to my staff and constantly remind them that you need to stay a certain distance away from each other. I know we're all didn't test positive the last time we were screened, but we don't know. So please maintain that office social distancing, especially when you're working, because you're going to have to create pathways. Sort of think about a little bit about how the grocery stores are working these days, where you have one aisle down and then one aisle coming back. And so we're going to have to look at how we set up our pathways of, of bringing patients into our offices and then also exiting our offices. The limited use of waiting rooms. My waiting room used to have several chairs. Uh, my waiting room now has four chairs. I also have a couple chairs outside, but it's not what I've had in the past. So we're doing business differently. Alternative places for patients to wait, which came out in the ADA's recommendations, possibly the car. You could text the patient when it's time for their appointment, and they could be in the car doing business, or they could be listening to music, whatever, to make your patients feel comfortable. Something that I think is important is we have to protect our front desk staff. And we can have them in masks, that's fine. But remember, masks like a level one or a level two, they don't protect against aerosol, they protect against fluid. So literally, we're looking at putting in some sneeze barriers. Um, and you can find them at different um, stores, uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or et cetera, order them online or possibly get them from your dental distributors. I, I actually don't know. Uh, we're having one put in from the hospital. 
um, elimination of paper. Um, it's really sort of funny, but but um, we're going to go over how long uh, this virus can live on certain objects, and on printed paper, it can stay there for three hours. So we want to eliminate uh, as much paper as possible. And sensible PPE precautions for non-clinical staff. So wearing a mask and, and do we need to have eye protection or glasses fine at the front? Was the sneeze guard there? Are we really having to do much different? Maybe the mask or, or, or we, do we need to have them in N95? We do know that people talking create an aerosol and that when people talk loudly, they create a longer aerosol or bigger aerosol. When people sing, I think if you watched last week, we talked about that choir. We had one person who was infected with COVID who was symptomatic out of the 61, and then up to 87% of the members in that choir ended up with COVID. And it's also important to say three ended up in the hospital and two passed away. So we do need to remember that although we're loosening things up, we're getting ready to get started, the case counts are starting to drop, but let's don't make them go up. Um, and then communicate with our patients. They are our livelihood. They're who we become to establish relationships with. I know that my hygienists know more about the patients than I knew about the patients for years, but um, now I'm sort of, you know, Lifetime Achievement Award, Dr. Daddy, and so they all want to see me. And it's just wonderful being able to talk to our patients and, and let them know that we miss them, we're getting things ready, or we're bringing them back, and the office is going to look a little bit different. Some certain steps to make sure that the environment is set as we restart. Don't forget that the waiting room is an area we probably didn't think about disinfecting very often in the past. But now it's something that we need to look at. So toss those magazines. Make sure everything that you have is wipeable. So in other words, if you have um, chairs in your waiting room, make sure that you can wipe them down. Try to eliminate cloth. Uh, carpeting has never been a great idea in, in a dental setting. Um, but you really want to get the doorknobs, things like light switches, cabinet handles, and the front desk area where people will put their hands. Please make sure you wipe all that down. Um, offer hand sanitizer at the front desk or when you're checking in. You can't have too much hand sanitizer, although, you know, there is a bit of a shortage, so please make sure that you monitor it. Also, it's really important to screen our patients before they come in. So, like I said, we're taking temperatures. We want to ask about dry cough or shortness of breath. And then there's a whole list of other symptoms that we've covered in the past, including chills, muscle aches, um, and a new onset loss of taste. And there's some of those interesting manifestations that we see in a few cases, like COVID toes, but we probably won't be seeing too many toes. This is a slide that um, I'm proud to show you that uh, Dr. Severance actually lent me, and I'm very uh, pleased to have this information to share with you. This is the number of hours that similar viruses to COVID-19 live on surfaces. Now, there are studies that have already shown and been published that we know that um, COVID lives in an aerosol for up to three hours. We also know that it lives on um, stainless steel for up to 72 hours, which really sort of uh, was surprising to me, but uh, it's a new area for me. I think the one that is the most uh, interesting and possibly problematic is that paper money, that COVID can stay on paper money for up to 96 uh, hours. I have to admit that I didn't have much time for lunch yesterday, and I went for fast food and when I got the change, I was really hesitant, and so I made sure that I used my hand sanitizer after I put the cash back into my wallet. I think my days of using cash are coming to an end, but this gives you an idea of how long the virus or something similar to the virus will live on surfaces, including wood and plastic and ceramics, etc., so what are problem-solving approaches to the biggest issue that we face, which is how do we deal with this aerosol? Well, surface disinfection it has been a key to what we've done for years, and it always will be. I think we need to make sure that we follow the wet times on our disinfecting wipes. I sometimes feel that just people just wipe it down and think that's going to be fine. The, the material needs to be in contact with the surface as long as the manufacturer says and you need to follow those instructions to make sure you're properly disinfecting. And we have to put a greater focus on mitigating the impacts of aerosol while it's suspended, and the best way to do that usually is at the source. 
So how are we going to look during this pandemic? Well, we already know we look a whole lot different. We're not as busy. We know what an impact this this um, uh, epidemic pandemic has had on our practices, but we're coming out. We're coming out for air. So please, one, don't rush. Two, we're going to have to do some things that we might have to think of that we've never thought of before. Um, for instance, I really have used an open bay area in my program for um, a quite a long time. And I'm de- I regretfully designed my new clinic a couple months ago. And I only have one room that's a closed door. So that's my negative pressure room. And I can look at air transfer rates there, but I work at a hospital. I'm not a private practice. I'm not in an office. I'm not where I have to worry about a lease and what can I do and those kinds of things. So that's what our future might look like. What is our future looking like today? Routinely stocking N95s. And I know that's an issue of getting these respirators, but it is really important. Please listen to this. Level 1, 2, and 3 facial masks do not protect against aerosols. They protect against fluid. You need an N95 or greater or equivalent or greater. So it could be um, KN95s that are legitimate. And as we know, the FDA, we'll talk about that in a moment, has pulled several of the manufacturers away from those. And then there's also the European Union type. So we really need to make sure that we stock our N95s. That will be our, our new reality. Waiting room and operatory chairs that can be wiped down, no seams. And uh, I'm, as I told you, we're getting a new. I'm building a new program, and I'm, I'm looking at the at ADAC dental chairs. Uh, sorry to mention the brand, and I'm looking at all the remarkable colors that they have on one side, and then I look to the seamless, and I see like the ten colors that they have for seamless. Um, which was fine, and that's what I have to use because if you have seams, it's a place to track stuff. So I've always used seamless, and I think that's what we need to do, and the chairs need to be able to be wiped down as well. We need to look at air purification systems. Now, if we do really good high high volume evacuation at chair side, we will take up to 90% of the aerosol right there. And we're really, what are we doing about that 10%? So there's chair side aerosol extraction devices, and I'm not expert in any of these devices. They're standalone recirculation air purifiers, overhead air purification systems, and there's even exchange rate guidelines that I have down here. Please work with your representatives from the companies. They're the ones that are being trained on these devices. They're the ones that know more about them. I'm depending on information from sales reps and doing my own research to figure out what instruments I want to purchase. The issue that we have is that this sort of rushed into dentistry and and we don't have enough of these units. They're being fabricated now and some will be delivered in June and some will be delivered in July. So we really need to make sure that we follow the minimum standard, which is having an N95 that initially is fit tested. And then you don't have to do the annual fit testing. They have released that, but the initial time, you do need to get it fit tested. And then every time you put on your N95, make sure you have a seal. And that's important. One of the reasons that some of the KN95s were pulled is that they did not create a seal. All N95s and equivalents must create an airtight seal so you don't have to deal with the aerosol. As I mentioned, the FDA did pull approval for dozens of mask makers in China this month. Uh, More than 60 manufacturers in China who are exporting N95-style masks to the United States found out that a large number were low quality. I remember reading about one that was supposedly being a KN95, which means that 95% of the particulate matter would be um, uh, dealt with, and this only dealt with 30 So, FDA previously authorized the use of those respirators manufactured in China that had been tested by a recognized independent laboratory, even if they hadn't been tested by the U.S., that has changed. And we want to make sure that what we buy are legitimate products that were not, if if it seems too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. I do think that there are mask uh, or respirator uh, makers or sellers that are including fit testing kits. To be frankly honest, the whole fit testing idea is that that you're under a hood, 
you have your N95 on, if you've never done this before, it's sealed, and then they spray a, a, a little bit of a, an aroma and something sweet, and it, if you smell it, then the spit test failed. If you don't smell it, you're fine. And so that's all fit testing really is. And remember, these aren't like neck, you know, like a, a 15 and a half, 16 and a half, 17 and a half. These are small, medium, and large, and extra large. So you have to find the one that fits you the best. The other issue that we're going to have with N95s, and I think this is going to be a sensitive issue to some of my male colleagues, is it has to have a facial hair. It has to be able to, you have to be able to seal it on skin. It can't be on hair. Now, if I showed you all the different things that um, you, different hairstyles you can't have or facial hairstyles you can't have, you probably would turn this webinar off, so I won't. But just realize that facial hair does interfere with N95 fit and seal. Now, what I have, this little bit of, of white stuff that's on my face, um, that will not interfere with the seal. I've actually been fit tested like this. So just make sure that you get your initial fit testing if you've never had an N95, and these are new for dentistry. The other point I want to make is even if you have them before you're seeing patients, Try to wear them for a while and get used to the fact that when you that breathing might be a little bit more difficult or might be a lot more difficult, and that you have to take breaks in between patients, that, that it's not going to be this continuous, you know, factory kind of thing. So please, if you're in the process of just beginning to see patients, or you haven't started seeing patients, you're only seeing emergencies, and you do have N95s, wear them for a while to try to get used to it, because it is different. And when we're doing something different, we don't want to lose our focus on what we're good at. So I did want to go over some of the different kinds of facial filtering face piece respirators. There's uh, the one at the top that we're talking about here is good for aerosols. It's the N95 type uh, facial filtering face piece respirator. They are disposable. They cover the nose and the mouth. They filter out particles such as dust, mist, and fumes. And you can look at the different kinds of F efficacy levels that they have, but it does not provide protection against gases and vapors, which is not our concern. Uh, initial fit testing right now is required. Uh, OSHA has said that uh, for the time being, you don't have to do annual fit testing. Then there's the elastometric half face piece respirator. It's reusable and it has replaceable cartridges and filters, can be used to protect against gases, vapors, particles, if equipped with an appropriate cartridge or filter, covers the nose and the mouth, and again, fit testing is required. Then there's the elastometric full face piece respirator, and I've actually seen somebody using these. They're reusable face piece uh, in replaceable canisters, cartridges, or filters. They can be used to protect against gases, vapors, or particulate matter if equipped with the appropriate cartridge, canister, or filter. This one provides eye protection, which is really important. Um, eye protection for our patients is really important, too. Please don't forget that um, because there are some awful stories um, about uh, things ending up in patients' eyes. So eye protection for our patients is always important, as it is for us as providers. Has a more effective face seal, this elastometric full face piece respirator, than an N95 would have or the half face piece respirator would have, and fit testing is required. And then there's the last one, which I do know that people in different countries are looking at as a, as a strong possibility, which are PAPRs, or powered air purifying respirators. They're reusable and have replaceable filters. They can, be, they can actually protect against particulate matter, gases, vapors, as long as they're equipped with the appropriate types of canisters and cartridges. They're battery powered with a blower that pulls air through the attached filters or cartridges. It provides eye protection and it has low breathing resistance. And I think that's key. If you have some staff that can't handle the N95, then maybe this is the direction. It's just a possibility. I'm just offering it out there that these are what's out there. I do know that there is some thought in England about potentially using these. So it's just a thought and something that I thought you might be interested or aware of. So keeping our teams protected, that is uh, the most important thing. And so if respiratory protection must be used, employers need to provide equal or greater protection compared to N95. And NIOSH approved non-disposable elastometric respirators or the PAPRs. And here's an example of what the full PAPR looks like. I think it would be a little bit spacey looking, but then again, so are N95 masks and everything else we have on. And we'll see where we go. This is just an option that's out there. 
But we talked about this. Immediate capture is really where we get most of the aerosol. Efficient use of high volume evacuation can cut down the, the pathogen release about 90%, as I've mentioned. Using a rubber dam is actually going to decrease the amount of pathogen in the aerosol. So if you can work with a rubber dam, that's great. Um, but proper high volume evacuation is considered fundamental and essential to all aerosol generating procedures. So that is what we have been doing for decades. We should be good at that. And now it's what do we do with the other 10%? How are we going to address that? So there, these are not devices that just sort of hit the market today. They've been, some of them have been around, not many, but some of them have been around since the 60s and 70s. They were developed primarily to rectify problems um, with the emergent dental air abrasion systems. And so that's bladder was going everywhere, and we needed to figure out a way to deal with that. Then the same systems were redeployed for the purpose of safe amalgam removal, and now we're using them to address aerosols. So, And there's all these newer devices that have UVC inside them, and et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is that some won't be delivered until June, some won't be available until July, and so Wearing your N95 and using high volume evacuation, those are still important, and looking at air scrubbers are important as we open up our practices. The extra oral vacuum systems um, really have to have proper placement to make sure that they work, and this is again is going to be something new for us. So we're opening up sort of at a half pace volume, and when those devices get here, it's going to be getting used to something different. So uh, we're already getting used to N95s. That's going to be new and how we deal with that. And now, well, if you choose to get an extra oral vacuum system, which I've chosen to care for every one of my operatories, you'll have something that's in the field of you. And so we have to get used to having something else that's in our field, uh, our line of sight, and how we work around that to make sure our high volume evacuation on both sides is equally good. Um, there are a lot of these devices out there. There are portable units with immediate filtration, um, and that should be used. Uh, we're going to use that whenever aerosol generating procedures are performed. But remember that all the different vacuum systems can be affected by lateral airflow. So if you have a window or a door open or air conditioning cycles, you have to really be careful where you place these to make sure that it's not getting blown. Just it, It's just common sense when it comes to this. But then again, work with sales reps, work with the people that you have helped design your offices. But this should be a pretty easy fix. So a continued clinical issues that we're going to face is the availability of PPE. Uh, specifically N95s. I know many of my colleagues, uh, especially in the Northeast and some out West, donated their N95s to hospitals for frontline workers, um, and now they're out and they're having a hard time getting them. Hopefully, we will be able to access our N95s because I wouldn't do any aerosol generating procedures without an N95 or equivalent. The availability of new technologies, such as the extra oral um, vacuums, uh, aerosol vacuums, it's taking a while to get there. Today, I'm getting my first air exchange units coming in. Um, I'm excited about that. They will be here any moment. And then work on proper patient flow. Remember, I sort of talked about that, that we have patients coming in. We're going to be having patients coming out. We have to maintain some sort of physical distancing. There are certain things that are just new on how we're going to be doing our work, and we have to adjust. And I think that's why not opening full bore, but opening up generally, as most of us are doing, um, and then seeing how these changes are infecting our practice, are affecting our practice, and making sure that we, we let our patients know it's safe to come back. Very disturbing news that's coming out about uh, childhood and vaccinations, where we've seen a great reduction in, in people going and getting their children vaccinated, not because of anti-vax sentiments, but because they don't want to go to the doctor. They're afraid. And we have to let our patients know that we have created a remarkably safe environment for them. I think that is the key, that they can come to us, they can get their oral health care, because you can't be healthy without oral health, and in a safe and welcoming environment. And since we talked about my first passion, Ms. Ross, at the beginning, I thought I'd end by talking about another one of my passions, which are my little dogs. You have them, too, there. Grady is the little Westie. Um, he's now a year old. And Timmy is my Shih Tzu, uh, named after my favorite college football player, Tim Tebow. 
So again, thank you uh, for your time and attendance, and back to you, Gary. Thank you, Dr. Resnick, and again, congratulations. Now I'd like to introduce you to Lee Culp. Lee is one of my favorite people in and out of dentistry, and he's the CEO of Sculpture Dental Laboratories in Cary, North Carolina. Now Lee is 24-7 about dentistry. He's either during the day and sometimes night at the bench, or outside lecturing around the world, but he's also married to a prosthodontist that's a professor at UNC, and his daughter practices in Florida. Lee is going to share with us some points that are key in working better and safer with your laboratory as you move back into your routine care. Lee? Hi, Gary. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And thank you, Henry Schein, for having me on today and kind of letting me tell my COVID-19 story and how we're trying to help our clients through this process as they start to reopen. So our laboratory has been digital as long as you can possibly be digital. So it's kind of interesting the things we're seeing today because digital has, has a definitive reason to be in dentistry today because nothing has to be sent to me. So approximately 60% of all the cases that come into our laboratory are digital, which means there is no disinfecting. There is no possibility of disease transfer because it all comes in through a digital file. So this is the time, if you've ever really thought about it before, this is the time to really think about it because there is a definitive objective reason to be looking at this technology to be working with your laboratories. So I'm gonna take you through several cases today just to show you what we can do. We can do single, very simple single restorations, uh, molars, bicuspids, whatever. Uh, or we can do implant restorations to something very, very complicated. And I'm gonna just kind of walk through several of those today during my time and just show you how we're working with our dentists today with digital data, which would be intraoral scanning and CT scanning, along with TeamViewer and some other technologies that we're using today to build a virtual patient. And that's what we want to do. So we have access to your patients. We have access to communication with you. And today is definitively the time to start looking at this technology because of all the benefits it offers. So I'm going to switch to slides right now and then I'll see you back uh, in a few minutes. All right, let's get started. So digital dental has the ability to send files instead of impressions between specialists and laboratories. That's actually just one small aspect. Digital dental has been around for quite a while, but now with the current COVID-19 pandemic, it really, there's really an objective reason to go explore intraoral scanning, CT scanning, because as a laboratory, I would much rather receive data than physical impressions, models, and bites. So the other thing is communication and just working better together. So the technologies we're going to talk about in the next 20 or 30 minutes are intraoral scanning, CT scanning, face scanning, and then shade software that we can use to communicate shade also. But the goal here is to create a virtual patient. So when we look at the digital team, roles and responsibilities are changing a bit. So in the past, um, my laboratory and most every other laboratory, our job in the restorative world was to make teeth to make teeth per Rx from a dentist. And everybody was good with that. Dentist prep, laboratories make teeth. But things are changing because of digital. So very nicely, I'm able to join the team much, much earlier in the process in diagnosis and treatment planning. So we get to redefine the roles a little bit about what people do. So when we look at what I consider myself today is more of a clinical technician. So we do as much diagnosis, treatment planning, surgical planning, orthodontic planning as we do in actually making things. So because of digital and the data sets that come in, I kind of do the heavy lifting for the specialist and the restorative dentist, the periodontist, the oral surgeon, the orthodontist, and kind of get everything built in a virtual patient. 
kind of get things where they need to be and let specialists come on and tweak things and move things so they're optimally done. As you start using this, te this technology, you're becoming a technical dentist, which I think is a great thing. You're now doing some of my job, especially if you're using some of the systems that allow you to create your own restorations in your office. So now you're, I'm doing a little bit of what you do. You're doing a little bit of what I do, which I think is a great thing. The next one, as digital has really entered, communication has become ultimate. Now we have surgeons really becoming interested in the restorative process. So when we design cases, we've normally got the restorative dentist, the periodontist or oral surgeon, and myself, and we're working together using CT scans, intraoral scans to optimally design where implants should be, the best for the surgeon, the best for the restorative process to make sure we get a great outcome for the patient. So digital dentistry does a lot of things. Intraoral scanning is kind of the start of that to start sending data. But then we all become digital technicians. So as we're becoming digital technicians, we're all working together and doing things the way they need to be done and communicating much, much better to become very predictable in our work outcomes. So my laboratory is totally digital. We've been digital as long as you could possibly be digital. So we've been digital upwards of 20 years. And again, evolving, changing. Uh, 20 years ago, we weren't completely digital, but we were exploring using it as much as we can and now completely digital today. So our laboratory is in Cary, North Carolina, where we do a lot of surgery, uh, a, lot of, a lot of implant work, still doing smile designs and things like that. But again, the most important thing is all digital. With 60% of the impressions coming in and data coming into our laboratory as intraoral scans. Now, before COVID-19 really appeared on the horizon and started affecting the world and dentistry in a very great way, we didn't even know it, but we're already preparing for it because the FDA has found dental laboratories. So we were one of the first to become affiliated with the FDA with compliancy. So we had a quality control program that was FDA compliant, and we were, we were doing very good, <laughs> doing the work under a very quality controlled process. Earlier this year, the FDA changed the rules a little bit in that we've gone from being compliant to now we have to be fully registered with the FDA as a class two medical device manufacturer working in the dental space. And what that means is anything created, especially with implants with CAD CAM, whether we take a tie base and design a zirconia crown to go over the top of it, the screw retain, that is now a class two medical device and we are required to be registered with the FDA. Same thing with surgical guides, which we do a lot of. So FDA registration is very important to the future of the laboratory, as we now must be FDA registered or we're actually doing things illegally. So our laboratory is in Cary, North Carolina, and this is what a digital laboratory looks like. Not just ours, but many, many others. You can see it's not the dental laboratory of the past. We have nice, clean environments. We have lots of computers. We have lots of robots. We still finish things by hand, so you still see porcelain furnaces, hand pieces, and things like that. But everything in the laboratory is digital, and everything is designed on a computer. So when we look at digital planning, there are several data sets required. The first one would just be an intraoral scanner, like the three-shaped three trios scanner you see here, and then CT if we're going to get into surgery. But the main one to really get started is an intraoral scanner, uh, and there are several on the market that do a very, very excellent job. So when we have these two data sets, we can do some amazing things. So we're going to start fairly simple. 
with a very simple implant case. So this is an implant digital workflow. I'm working with Dr. Mark Ludlow at MUSC University, and we're going to be doing something fairly simple as one implant in the lower mandibular anterior. So when we do this, we're going to do a diagnostic wax up very, very quickly as we do it on the computer. We're going to import that diagnostic wax up into our CT scan along with an intraoral scan, and we're going to put all those data sets together. So this is a quick diagnostic. So here's our space that we're looking at. It's going to require an implant to be placed in this space, but the goal is to immediately load and put a temporary on that, not just do an implant. So we're going to be using several different softwares to be going through this process. So first is an intraoral scan. So the intraoral scan comes in. I'm going to quickly do a diagnostic wax up, and then we're going to import that data into our design software with a CT. This is the Implant Studio software. So we want this screw retained, so I set all the files up. I have uh, Dr. Ludlow take a look at them just to verify that everything is exactly where we need it to be from a restorative and a surgical outlook. And then once we design the guide, I'm going to take that guide and introduce it back into my dental design software so I know exactly where the implant is and exactly how to design my temporary. So what I'm going to do is design a temporary over that implant, and I'm going to attach little wings to it so it sits very precisely in place so it can be attached to the temporary cylinder. So it's going to look something like this. So I know where the implant is going to be. I'm going to pre-drill a hole that my mill will drill out. Uh, so, and it's a little bit larger than the temporary cylinder, so the doctor can attach it in the mouth, again, very precisely with the little wings on the side. So it looks something like this. Then we're going to mill that out of, a high, of an industrially processed <clears throat> double cross-linked PMMA layered that looks very, very nice and is very, very strong. So as we go through this process, implant, our design, and then our final mill. We have little windows in the incisal edges, so the doctor knows it's precisely in place. We have printed a model, and it snaps perfectly onto the model. We have created our surgical glide that also fits precisely on the model. And from the model, it fits precisely in the mouth. So now we're going to place the implant. So the doctor will do his osteotomies and place the implant and then attach the temporary cylinder to that. So now we're going to introduce the temporary over the top of it. And it simply fits beautifully over the top of the temporary cylinder. <clears throat> we know where the gingiva is. It's precision placed because it's locked into the two adjacent teeth. And then he'll just uh, add composite to attach the temporary to the temporary cylinder cut off the little wings, take off the excess off the bottom after he unscrews it, and then he's very quickly got the implant designed, placed with a temporary very, very quickly, very, very predictably. So now it looks something like this after it's cleaned up and then inserted back into the mouth. <clears throat> We've got a very, very beautiful implant outcome. So from here, we would go and let that heal and then use that same design and go to our final ceramic restoration. But again, we, we did all this, and this is the important thing to understand. There was never anything sent to my laboratory physically. No impressions, no models, no bites. Everything was data. So now we're going to step up a level, still kind of keeping in the digital workflow with implants and we're going to do something a little more complex. Now I've picked implants because that's kind of where we start from, but you can see how easy this would be with single restorations, smile designs, three unit bridges. We do all of it. We've done some very, very complex work only with data, only with printing models and milling and printing our final restorations. So this is with a very good friend of mine and mentor, Dr. Jonathan Ferens in New York. 
and we wanted to see the workflow for creating abutments and a bridge. And again, with no nothing physical ever sent to my laboratory, everything was data. So these implants had already been placed. So what Dr. Ferens was going to do was scan the oral environment, also scanning scan flags. So preoperative condition, implants placed, healing caps on, presented to Dr. Ferens, and then he added the scan flags. So a radiograph to make sure they're precisely seated. And then this is what it looks like in the scan. So the scan flags, when they're introduced into my software, I find out what type they are, locate them, and then pin them onto my design software. When I do that, the implants appear below the scan flags, the exact type, size, dimension, angulation, and depth. And then we have our implants and we can build on top of that. And again, we haven't done anything. We haven't created, there are no models. Everything is done completely virtual. So we've got a scan of the scan flags. Everything has been matched together. And now we're ready to design. So this one's gonna be a little bit different. We're going straight to fixed. Uh, the implants have osseo integrated, so we're, we don't really need to do a temporary. We're gonna go straight to the final restorations. So the first thing we're going to do is design the teeth basically where they should be. So just kind of getting in them into place aesthetically, functionally, and from there, the computer will offer up a design automatically of the abutments that the computer thinks should be under those teeth and looking something like this. From here, we can modify based on tissue levels, based on aesthetics. We can change the abutments any way we would like to. And then the previously designed crowns, once the abutments are finished, the previously designed crowns just kind of snap to the new margins on our abutments. So we're creating the abutments and the bridge. This will be a three unit bridge, screw retained. We're creating them at the same time. So here you can see the abutments and the crowns. And then I'm adding my screw access holes to the crowns and they look something like this. So now I have two files. So what I'm going to do, at this time we were not <coughs> milling our own implant abutments, so I'm gonna send these out to a manufacturer who's gonna mill the implant abutments for me. During that time, I'm not gonna stop working. I've got the file for the bridge, so I'm gonna finish the bridge. I'm actually gonna mill the bridge, center the bridge, finish the bridge with glaze and ceramics, and I'll, I'll have it ready before the abutments return back to me. So there's the final design with the abutments and the design. So we're gonna finish the bridge and then wait for the abutments to return and then try them in. So we never made a model for this case. So everything was done digitally. We didn't even print models on this case. We just went straight to abutments and the final bridge. These were sent to Dr. Ferens in New York where he placed the abutments and then placed the bridge on the top. Minor occlusal adjustments, minor uh, interproximal adjustments, but we're talking rubber wheels and, and just minor adjustments. So no, no major adjustments. Three unit bridge with abutments. No physical data was ever sent to me, efficient, predictable, practical, and great communication, great communication between myself and the restorative doctor. So our final bridge, very nice outcome, using the technology that we have today. And again, yeah, I, I just, it's so important, especially in today's world, to know that nothing physical was ever sent to me, just data. So, Let's talk about some of the other technologies we can use. I read a lot of AI books, artificial intelligence. I have a whole library of them and because the concept actually very intrigues me of where we're going with computers. So out of all the books I have, this is kind of a thought process that I see written within all the books. 
not exactly like this, but I'm just kind of paraphrasing what I've seen in many, many books. And that is technological advance is not a linear progression, but is now based on exponential jumps. So what does that mean? We as humans tend to think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We go from one step to the next step. But with technology the way it is now, that's not the way it works. So in the past, one and two generally equal three. One and two don't always equal three anymore. One and two now can equal eight or nine or 10 or 11. And I'll show you technologies that happen. So if we look at consumer-based technology like the iPhone, and we look at technology companies that are taking advantage of what an iPhone can do, one of the first ones that we've been working with and helping them develop their software and their technology is a company called Shadewave. So in the past, because I've been working with color documentation and instrumentation for 15 to 20 years testing different systems, and the systems were anywhere from $5,000 to $30,000 requiring lots of equipment. With the technology we have in consumer, this company was able to take advantage of the iPhone technology and offer their software into that. So we just take a picture with a phone and then the software looks at the shade, shade mapping, looking at translucency, shade guides, value, all of that just with an iPhone. The other company that's taken advantage of consumer technology advances is Bellis 3D. So this is another company we saw early on, and I and many others in dentistry contacted them about doing something specifically for dentistry. So Bellis 3D is face scanning. And again, face scanning is nothing new. Uh, several CTs have it incorporated into their technology and to their instrumentation. There are several systems out there on the market, but again, they were anywhere from five to ten to twenty-five thousand dollars, and I couldn't justify an ROI on that when it was in my laboratory and my clients really had no access to it. So when we first heard about Bellus 3D, we got very excited because Bellus is using consumer technology, which is the iPhone 11 that has face recognition software, and then they have piggybacked on top of that to be able to use that technology to be able to do 3D face scanning and then develop something especially for dentistry, which is 3D, Bellis 3D Dental Pro. Now to us in the laboratory, it's really the missing link because we've got intraoral scans, we've got CT scans, but I, I don't see the patient. Digital photographs are, are nice and fun and, and an excellent way to communicate, but I really wanted to see the patient, and this is what we're able to do. So we've got an intraoral scan, and we're just going to show you what we can accomplish. So the intraoral scan we have here, this is generally what we have, but this becomes so much more valuable when we can add a CT scan to it. And then we've got two data sets. But when we can take this just a little farther and add another data set to it and mesh it on very, very accurately, this is where things become very exciting in dentistry. So we contacted Bellus 3D and uh, they did develop something specifically for us, Bellus 3D Dental Pro. They came to one of our courses and we were talking about some of the nuances because they were still trying to figure out in their head, why was this such a good thing for dentistry? So we showed them in our course, and then we proposed the idea to them of a digital face bow. So it took them a, a month or so, but they actually came back to us with a really beautiful, elegant precision design that's on your phone. Bellus 3D, face scanning, and then mounting that face with a digital face bow that is transferred to us and then we can use it in our design software and actually mount it on a digital articulator using that face bow. So 
This is myself and some of my team at UIC in Chicago and the Grad Pross Residency Program where we're teaching them how to use this technology and kind of installing it in. And so here we see really the phone app on the side where the doctor has taken a face scan and then applied the digital face bow. In the middle you can see where we have imported that into our design software and use that digital face bow to mount it on the digital articulator. I mean, this is, this is really just absolutely amazing technology that allows us really great communication between dentist, specialist, laboratory, and even the patient. So we can use this a lot for digital diagnostic design and digital restorative design. So let's, let's look at a case. So this is a fairly typical case coming into the laboratory. This will be a smile design case. We've already done a digital diagnostic wax up. And this was before we had the face scanning. So we've done a diagnostic wax up. We've made temporaries. So we've got another layer of data, which is the digital temporaries overlaid over the preparations. And we would simply design our new restorations to follow the temporary restorations because they're in the mouth, they're approved. Patient likes the aesthetics, the link, the length, the phonetics, the function. All we have to do as a laboratory is really copy what the patient and the dentist have approved. But as we're looking and I'm, a, I'm evaluating this case, we were sent a face scan. So I'm looking at the face scan with the temporaries in the mouth and I notice a slight cant, even though everything has been approved. So I called the doctor and I said, can you send me a really good two-dimensional image of the patient? Because I just want to verify something. And when I got the 2D photo, I saw the slight cant also. So it was very easy for me with the face because we did compare 2D to 3D to very quickly change a cant, verify everything with a face bow, and then move on to the final restorative design and then milling of those restorations. So digital design and how we're using it even further because intraoral scanning is not just for crown and bridge and implants. We can also use it for dentures. So we do dentures here in the laboratory today more for the design of implants, but dent digital dentures have a, a special place in my heart because I've done a lot of denture tooth design. So the companies that were designing this came to me and asked me to be on the team, uh, which was a little odd because I have absolutely no idea how to do a denture conventionally, but I was taught how to do dentures in two days digitally. Now again, after two days, I was absolutely no master, but I knew the basics and I could create a denture. And I've subsequently learned a whole lot more over the years, but we're able to do some amazing things from intraoral scanning. And we're gonna walk through this and just show you what we can do. So the denture that you're looking at now is two pieces. There is a milled base and there are milled teeth. The teeth are milled as a bridge, and we simply bond the two together and then finish to create really, really beautiful dentures. And then most of the dentures that we do are designed for final implants. So let's show how face scanning helps us not just in Craner Bridge, but also in denture fabrication. So in this video, we have a patient. This is my wife. She teaches at UNC, Dr. Lita Swan. <clears throat> this is the patient. We have an iPad Pro, which we prefer. iPad Pros do have facial recognition, and the software simply tells Look you what camera, to do camera. as camera. the software is taken. This is an app. You can go to the App Store and, and buy it and download it, and it's very easy to use. But the software actually tells the the person that's getting the face scan, Tilt what to do, how to move, to uh, as you can see in the video. Tilt your head down. Turn to the middle. Capture so once the scan is complete, it's going to place all the data together. And then you really, you'll have a 3D face and head pop up in front of you. Patients think this is absolutely the most amazing thing they've ever seen. 
Now the doctor is going to show the patient. So, so there's, there's our patient. And we can move the head around. And then she's going to download and send that to the laboratory where we're going to start our denture design. And again, denture design fairly follows a fairly comprehensive denture process where we're going to mark our peripheral borders. We're going to do uh, alignment and undercuts. We're going to set up our teeth based on anatomical landmarks. And then we're going to add the tissue. The tissue is actually added fairly automatically with the computer software. Now this is where it gets fun though, because one of the areas that's really needed with faces is dentures, because we're in dentures we're generally always doing a full mouth rehabilitation. So now, instead of just using the bite block, we, as a starting point and anatomical references, we can actually put it in the patient's mouth and adjust based on aesthetics based on tooth length, based on lip length, and again, we get a very, very accurate representation of where these teeth are going to be. So face scanning is, is something we have found indispensable in our communication and design for any types of restorations. So we're going to finish that denture up once it's designed, and we're going to do a try-in. And again, a lot of this is still from intraoral scans. Uh, we do have to transfer. To, we have been working a lot with intraoral scans on dentures. We're getting really good results, but we're not getting really great results yet. And when I say that, it's more in the predictability. When we get a good scan, we get a great denture. Sometimes it's hard because of tissue anatomy to get great scans every time. But if it's the proper thing to do, we can actually finish dentures from an intraoral scan. If not, we'll do an initial try-in and then kind of reline that with impression material and take a conventional impression and move to the next step. So we're going to do a denture try-in. On our denture try-ins, we print the bases and print the teeth. So here's our denture bases printed. Here's all our teeth printed, and they're printed in bridges. And then we'll bond those two together and then let the patient try them in and check occlusion, phonetics, fit, things like that. I do think all dentures in the future will be printed. Right now, we only do printed as a try-in because of aesthetics and some other reasons. And then we'll go to mill for our final version. But printing and printing resins are getting better every day. In the future, I think all dentures will eventually be printed. So we're going to go to final denture fabrication where we will mill everything out. So again, the teeth are milled as a bridge, and we have the base milled and the teeth milled, and this is how we make a denture okay, today. Good. So we've got our bases that are milled, and we've got our teeth that are milled. So what we're doing is taking some of the printed resin resin, which is pink, and we're just painting it into the sockets. So it's, it's a light cured resin. It's the same resin we used to print dentures with. We're going to place it in the sockets and place the teeth and take a device we invented here at the laboratory, the paper clamp, and we're going to clamp it together and then light cure it. This is how we make dentures today, whether it's a try-in denture or a final denture. And then we'll put everything together, contour, polish. Uh, this does have some composites added to the facial on the tissue for heightened aesthetics, but we get very, very nice dentures doing them digitally. Ready for insertion. We get a great result, very predictable. <clears throat> so one of the, some of the things we're seeing with digital dentures, the main thing is the fit. The fits are phenomenal. So we're not seeing a lot of post-insertion pain, hot spots, sore spots, high spots, <clears throat> they just really fit, which is something that is really making these dentures incredibly stable. So our final denture and our patient.
Now, we don't do dentures just to do dentures. We do, but we don't specialize in dentures. But we do use dentures to start the process for all on whatever implant planning for surgical and, res and restorative planning because everything we do starts with a denture. So we start with a denture to really nail down exactly where the teeth need to be. We can try those out. The patient can wear them. Um, so the, the denture adds a lot to the process of planning for implants because we do a lot of implant planning here in the laboratory. So what we'll do is the denture we started with, and this is what makes it so cool. So we started with a denture to start the denture planning process, but when we're ready to go to the final surgical uh surgical guide, we'll take the original denture we made and we'll pre-convert it. We'll go back to that denture in our design. We'll pre-convert it. You can see I've designed little outriggers here. So it's going to be very stable when we place it in the mouth. We're going to add holes for it for the temporary cylinders to pop through, kind of like the first case. But once the temporary the implants have been placed, the temporary cylinders have been placed, and they come through the holes in the denture and attached, the doctor will simply remove the denture, cut off the outriggers very, very easily, and the denture is now converted. So we don't ask any of our, our dentists to convert a denture. We send them a pre-converted denture at the time of the surgery. And everything matches up perfectly. So we've got the surgical guide, we've got the denture, everything aligns perfectly. It's very easy to convert it with, you know, with five or six simple cuts. We take the outriggers off and the pallet off that gives us our stability. So we can take that denture and convert it very, very quickly into an immediate load temporary prosthetic. And this is what we really specialize in, is putting those data sets together. But again, on most of these cases, nothing physical was ever sent to the laboratory. So the last one, this is what we're, we're trying to really get across is the ability for dentists and technicians and laboratories and specialists to work closer than they ever have before. And especially since we're in this era of COVID-19 and the pandemic, we're slowly opening up. But now's the time to really look and see how you can better work with your patients, work with your laboratory, and get a predictable result finally for your patients. So this last case is where we developed a lot of the concepts that we use today, and that's the Jaw in the Day program. So I was, I was invited to be on this team about eight years ago from Dr. Larry Brecht in New York. Dr. Larry Brecht is a maxillofacial prosthodontist. David Hirsch was the uh, maxillofacial surgeon that kind of developed the process, and they invited me to kind of work out the back end of the process for them. They had kind of done the front end. So what this is a surgical prosthetic planning to re replace parts of the maxilla or the mandible. And we're going to go through a case fairly quickly. But we have a diseased mandible here. In the past, we, the surgeons would have removed the diseased part of the mandible. They would have gone to the leg, reflected the tissue, looked at the fibula, and verbally picked the part of the fibula that they thought would fit best back to replace the bone of the mandible. Now we're doing it a little bit different today. Everything is digital. We all get together on a team viewer meeting. <clears throat> the medical surgeons, the uh, dental surgeons, the prosthodontists, the laboratory are all working together to design these cases and figure out what's going to be the optimal position for the bone, which bone, where the implants go, and for the, where the final prosthetic goes. So here we're, we've got CT scans of the skull and the fibulas. As the surgeons are measuring and trying to estimate which part of those bones are going to work the best. And all this is done digitally. I've already done a diagnostic wax up that we're going to use to design the guide and placement of the implants. So we do that during the surgical process also. 
So the uh, bone replacement and the implants are all designed at the same time. That data is all sent to me where I combine the data and design the temporary restorations. So the blue is the simulated thickness of tissue that we think we're going to have over the bone. Well, when I send all that back, medical 3D systems medical modeling is going to start designing the cut guides. The cut guides are going to go on the fibula and on the mandible, and the cut angles and guides will allow the cuts on the fibula to be exactly the same as the cuts in the mandible so everything fits back together much like a puzzle. So now we're ready for surgery. Here's all the parts and pieces that we've developed digitally through intraoral scanning and CT scanning. Again, nothing physical was ever sent to my laboratory. The surgical team, and then placing these cut guides on the mandible to remove the diseased part in a very precision way. It's going to match the cuts that we're that the surgeons are also doing on the fibula. So while out of the mouth, we're going, they're going to cut the bone, fold the bone, reattach the bone, and place the implants and create the replacement mandible for our patient. During that time, the data also goes to Stryker where they're going to digitally create the bone anchor to hold everything back together. So three teams kind of working together to create all the parts and pieces. So here's the replacement mandible, ready to be placed. This is after placement and wired back all together. The final radiographs of everything placed. And then the final restoration implants and temporary restoration several months later, <clears throat> showing a very successful development, and then we'll move to the final. My goal here was to really show you what digital can do and why it's such an important part of today's dentistry, especially with the environment that we tend to be working on now and as dentists start to open up. It's now's the time to really go explore this technology. So I want to thank Dr. Gary Severance. I would really like to thank Henry Shine for allowing me to send this message out to you. Everybody have a wonderful week and everybody stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee, for that great presentation and all of the innovations you've brought to dentistry. If you have any questions, comments, or topics for future episodes, please let us know by emailing us at webinars at henryshine.com. And please subscribe to the Henry Shine YouTube page to get the latest news and notifications. Thank you again for all your comments and ideas and certainly your attendance. And as always, until we see you again, stay safe and stay informed.